Hey, Frank, how you doing, man? Good to see you. How are you? All right, great. Have a seat. All right. I've known Frank for a little over three years now. I consider Frank to be my friend. Do you know who Daryl Davis is? Yes, of course. Yeah. We were speaking at the same conference, and that's the conference that Daryl Davis was called neo-Nazi. I consider Daryl to be my friend as well. When I first thought about using that clip at the top of my piece, I got a little freaked out because my spidey senses told me I'd be painting a target on my back for normalizing KKK members. And to me, that just shows how f***ed up the culture is these days, because if you know anything about Daryl Davis, you'll know he's anything but a neo-Nazi. Daryl is a black man who befriends members of the KKK. He also collects their robes. But what's with his seeming obsession with them? Daryl is on a mission to understand what it is that truly motivates someone to hate him without even knowing him. And even though his mission is, by my estimation, noble and courageous, he's still called neo-Nazi. Which is very concerning because his efforts have convinced a reported 200 KKK members to give up their robes. Now, if you don't understand my concern, you probably aren't walking in the circles where this is a problem. But for people like artists who work in the entertainment industry, and I'm sure many other industries as well, this is a problem. Because as studies point out, the majority of Americans, not just artists, fear speaking their beliefs, with many even fearing for their livelihoods if they do. So if you happen to be one of those who feels this, rest assured because therein lies the topic of today's particular journey. As an artist, why should you tell the story you aren't supposed to tell? And we turn to none other than the amazing man himself, Daryl Davis. And by the end, I hope our conversation can show exactly why it's so important to brave reality and to tell the story that the people in your life and your culture might not want you to tell. Hey, Daryl, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Raymond. Thank you for having me, buddy. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. How have you been lately? Well, you know, I've been on lockdown uh, for the last, since, uh, since March, when I perform music. That's my real profession. And, you know, my whole calendar was like wiped out like overnight. Oh, and man. so I've only had like maybe a couple gigs since uh, March 5th. By real profession, what he means is blues and boogie woogie piano. But in my opinion, he's really downplaying what he's doing on the social front. Why do people dislike someone else because of the color of their skin? So I formed a question in my mind, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And I've been looking for that answer for the next 52 years. What did this experience sort of open you up to? In my teenage years and all through my adult life and still, I bought books on um, black supremacy, white supremacy, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here, anti-Semitism, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, all these things, trying to find that answer. So what did he do? He decided to make friends with KKK members. Now, if you don't already know the story of his first relationship with them, then I'll point you to where you can learn more at the end of this video. And trust me, it's well worth your time. But for now, all you need to know is that his first friend was a low-ranking member he met while playing country music at a bar called the Silver Dollar Lounge. I said, do you know Roger Kelly? Yeah, I know Roger. Roger's my grand dragon. Just so you know, a grand dragon is a leader in the KKK. I said, listen, I need you to connect me with uh, Roger Kelly. I want to meet him. I, I begged and pleaded with him to give me Mr. Kelly's phone number and address. And he finally gave it to me under the condition that I not tell Mr. Kelly where I got it. Cut forward and Daryl has his assistant, Mary, set up the interview so they don't give away the fact that he's black. We got the room, got there super early. And I gave her some money and sent her down the hall to get soda pop out of the machine and put it in the ice bucket, fill it with ice, get it all cold. Because, uh, you know, if the man came inside my room, I wanted to be hospitable. And I had a little bag beside me, a little black duffel bag that uh, contained a copy of the Bible and a cassette recorder, which I put in the middle of the table, and some blank cassettes in the bag. He was scheduled to be there at 5.15. I mean, right to the minute, 5.15, there was a knock on the door. In walks what is called the Grand Nighthawk. A Nighthawk means bodyguard, security, grand meaning for the Grand Dragon. And he's wearing like military camouflage. And on his hip, he had a, a semi-automatic handgun in a holster. And uh, Mr. Kelly was walking directly behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. The Nighthawk turns the corner and sees me and just stops dead in his tracks. Mr. Kelly did not realize that his uh, Nighthawk had stopped short. And so he walked right into his back and like knocked the guy forward. And so now they're both are bumbling and stumbling around. Their faces were, were saying, did the desk clerk give us the wrong room number? Did we misunderstand something? 
or it's just an ambush. So I stood up and I displayed the palms of my hands so they could see I had nothing on me. And I walked forward, I extended my right hand, and I said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. And he shook my hand. Now, even though Daryl was able to break the tension for a moment, it didn't mean they were on the same page. Before I could sit down, Mr. Kelly asked me if I had any identification. And so um, I uh, gave him my driver's license. And then he, re- he remarked, uh, oh, you live on such and such street uh, in Silver Spring. And, you know, that had me a little concerned. You know, wh- why is this guy reading my address? So I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live. And you live at. And I named his house number and his street. That way I was leveling the playing field. So clearly everyone's on edge. And adding to that tension is the fact that Daryl had a duffel bag with him where he kept things like his recording tapes. Well, every time I'd reach down, the Nighthawk would reach up to his hip. Well, a little over an hour or so into this interview, there was a very fast, very quick um, noise. Like a ch- That was it. And it happened so fast and it was so short that my ear could not discern what it was. I was about to come across that table. You know, when you fear for your life, you go into what's called survival mode. And in survival mode, you're limited to what you can do, to maybe four different different things. Some people, the fear is so great, their brain shuts down because the brain cannot process that amount of fear, and they pass out, they faint. I don't do that. Other people, their, their muscles get real tight and they constrict and they can't move. That's called paralysis by fear. I don't do that either. The third thing people will do is to run away. That is the option that I would have taken had it been available. But it was not available because you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. I jumped up out of my chair and hit the table, and I didn't have any weapon. My secretary was not armed. The only person who I knew for sure who was armed was the Nighthawk. All I knew was, I'm in danger. So the the last option is to do a preemptive strike. Get them before they get you. And that's what I was on my way to do. So as I came up and hit the table, I was looking right into Mr. Kelly's face. My eyes were were talking louder than than, than my mouth could talk. And they were saying to him, what did you just do? And his eyes were fixated on mine. And I could read his eyes. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the Nighthawk had his hand on the butt of his gun. He was like looking back and forth between both of us, like, what did either one of y'all just do? (laughs) The ice in the ice bucket had begun melting, and the cans of soda were shifting down the ice. That was it. So somebody almost got shot over a damn ice cube. But this is very, very important. This was a teaching moment, all because some foreign entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice cans of soda, had entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we became fearful and accusatory of each other because we were ignorant as to what was going on. Doesn't matter how old you are uh, or how rich, how poor, what color you are, that is a natural flow of events. Ignorance breeds fear. We fear those things we don't understand. If we do not address that fear, that fear will then escalate and breed hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. And then the hatred makes us angry. And if we don't check that hatred, that hatred and anger will escalate and breed destruction. We want to destroy the things that we hate, but guess what? They may have been harmless, And we were simply ignorant. Daryl is telling a story he isn't supposed to because he understands that this goes much deeper than just the color of one's skin. Daryl is daring and uses his art to bridge the heavily reinforced divide. He does it through his music and work. He did it when he interviewed Roger Kelly and with the audacity to suggest that a black man and a white supremacist can actually be friends. He continues to do it today. I feel like What society wants is for people to pretend like as long as you play your role, that everything is cool. Get angry when you're supposed to get angry. Be sad when you're told to be sad, to shut up and just play your part. It kind of reminds me of the anxiety I felt when I was younger, when some people that I looked up to would tell me that I should stop being who I was, that I needed to be quieter and basically shut up. And because I always wanted to please everyone, I would do that. The only problem is that I did have things to say, some important things, I think. And because I couldn't talk about them, it built up in me until I was 
basically a basket case. <laughs> and the whole point to it was to always keep the peace, you know, and to just always be good. The only thing was that. I had to deny the pain and the horrors of my life at the time. And honestly, I do think that led me to try to seek out what pain actually felt like because I was denying it, you know? And um, the weirdest thing was it, I kind of liked it. It made me feel alive because it brought me back to the feeling of honesty. And in the end, I think that to some extent, reinforce the idea of filmmaking for me because filmmaking is basically a world where we deny reality in pursuit of reality you know <laughs> what would you say is well, the biggest misconception people have about dealing with this today uh, the biggest one probably be is that it can't be cured it can be cured it can be cured that cure is called education and exposure and we spend too much time especially in this country talking about the other person, talking at the other person, and talking past the other person. Why don't we spend a little more time talking with the other person? But Raymond, you say, what if my ideas accidentally hurt somebody? There are some things that are fragile, like a wine glass. If you knock it over, it breaks, nothing good happens. If something is plastic, you knock it over, it doesn't get damaged, but it doesn't get better. But there are some things that have to be stressed or challenged, like the immune system. If you protect your kid's immune system and use bacterial wipes, you're actually hurting the kid. You're preventing the system from getting information it needs. Same thing with social life. If you protect your kids from being excluded, from being insulted, from being teased, when they grow up, it's like the princess and the pea, a little tiny thing that they encounter on campus. Now when I first meet these guys, you know, we're you know, at opposite ends of the spectrum. And the more time we spend together, you find you have something in common. And by the time you get about right here, you have established a relationship. You may not be best of friends, but you have a relationship. You respect one another. And the trivial things that you have in contrast, such as your skin color, or whether you go to a church, a temple, a mosque, or a synagogue, begin to matter less and less. And you, and you begin to see those prejudices begin to dissipate and fade away. I think that as storytellers, we believe in things like compassion, curiosity, courage, and honesty. We want to make the world better by sharing these beliefs through the creation of experiences that people can relate to or be challenged by. The way that we do it is through storytelling and the creation of art by braving the reality of today's situation and risking what we need to in order to share these experiences. It gives us a broad and yet intimate connection with people out there in the world. We have to come together in this country because the best way for an enemy to defeat you is to divide and conquer. Our enemies are laughing at us. I'm not talking about people who like masquerade as artists trying to peddle their dogmas. I'm, I'm talking about those of us who believe that art and storytelling are a journey and that really the ends don't justify the means. We have to be honest and we have to be truthful and curious and courageous and all those sorts of things that can be scary. In his arguments on the importance of fighting slaveholding, one of my favorite role models in history, Frederick Douglass, responded to the anti-slavery society's decree that there could be no union with slaveholders by saying, quote, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. The idea being that by keeping the lines of communication open, by being courageous and working with slaveholders, that he could affect willing, positive change while also upholding the principles of freedom. I'd like to say that we have an obligation to be compassionate even to our enemies because it's not an obligation, it's a choice. Yeah. If we don't do that, then we risk solidifying their position. I consider Daryl to be my friend as well. Look, I think it can be really hard to stand firmly when the culture says you're an asshole because you want to say something controversial. But I would encourage us to look to examples like Daryl and Frederick as people who make the world better by telling the story they aren't supposed to tell. Unfortunately, in today's world, there's a fair chance that messages like this can get you canceled, even if it's just one small part of many things that you have to say. So I ask that if you think that this or one of the many things that I have to say to you, an artist or creative, is important that you subscribe to my channel by hitting the big red button and also the notification bell right next to it because it might otherwise get filtered out and you won't be able to see it when I post my next video. I I will also post more behind the scenes footage and more right here and also to my website. I'm Raymond Cinemato, and these are the life and times of one millennial film and TV producer from Los Angeles, California. And to all you cinemobsters out there, stay moist, my friends.